you have injustice and hope. In this lesson, we will learn that the Lord of all creation cares for all people. Happy Sunday. And if you are missing your Sunday school, and you would like to be a part of our Sunday school, subscribe, ring the bell, and you'll be notified each time we upload a new lesson. Hi, my name is Regina Reed, and I am Sunday school teacher at Antioch Missionary Baptist Church in Mabel, Mississippi. Now, let's get into this lesson. Today's lesson is Injustice and Hope, and it's coming from Genesis, the 21st chapter, the 8th through the 20th verse. And our lesson aims are one, list key features of the relationship among the six individuals, including God. Number two, compare and contrast Abraham's distress and that of Sarah and Hagar. And three, write a prayer to praise a praise for God's presence during a difficult time of life. Our background scripture is Genesis, the 28th chapter, the 8th through the 21st verse. And our print is Genesis, the 21st chapter, the 8th through the 20th verse. And our key verse is Genesis, the 21st chapter, 17th through the 18th verse. Let's start with the prayer. God who hears, we raise our voices to you. Strengthen our hope so that the world may have hope in you through our faith. Witness, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Introduction. Monocurary of ancient near East. Idolatry. Someone plants a tree and the rain waters it. Then someone cuts down the tree and uses half of it for firewood. And then the craftsman carves the other half into an image, claims it as a god, and asks it to save him. Now, how Isaiah wondered, could anyone in his own, his or her own right mind, do such a thing? A block of wood does not have understanding. It neither sees nor hears, let alone acts in history to save. Idolatry hasn't changed much over these centuries and beyond that type of idol. People who have achieved fame or are idolized. Yet these people were once babies, utterly dependent on their parents for everything. But because a person is a household name, some hang on to every word expecting inspiration that will put their life on the right path. But these idols cannot save either. The truth is only God can hear, speak, and act to save. He hears the cries of his people and he of his people and heeds the pleas of the oppressed. In today's lesson passage, we see the God of Abraham listening, attentively and offering a word of true hope. Lesson context. The second part of the book of Genesis could be called personal history. It is about people who have purpose in the plan of God to bring the Messiah into the world at the right time. Galatians, the fourth chapter, fourth verse. This section of Genesis begins with Genesis, the 11th chapter, and the 27th verse. The focus is on the descendants of Abraham, who continue through Isaac, Jacob, and the latter's 12 sons. When God called Abraham and Sarah, then Abram and Sarai, to leave Ur, he promised to bring them to the land he would give them and to make Abraham's family a great nation. It's Genesis, the 12th chapter, the first and third verse. Abraham entered Cana at age 75, and he was told that this was the land that God planned to give to Abraham's descendants. After Abraham and his nephew Lot went their separate ways, Abraham was again told that all the land he could see would be given to his descendants. Yet, Sarah was unable to conceive a child. Genesis 11th chapter and the 30th verse. She sought to overcome her barrenness by asking Abraham to impregnate one of her slaves. Sarah's logic in this seems strange to us. Why would a wife willingly allow her husband to have an intimate relationship with another woman? This seems to be a recipe for disaster. But the logic of this practice at the time went something like this. If my slave could produce a child, that child would be mine just like his mother is my property. Sarah thought she could have a son on the secondary way. 
and thus please her husband. One of their slaves was an Egyptian named Hagar. That's Genesis, the 16th chapter and the third verse. She presumably came into their household when the family stayed in Egypt. Hagar was Sarah's personal attendant. When Abraham and Sarah's attempt to produce a child were unsuccessful, Sarah offered Hagar to Abraham, never asking the slave's consent, hoping this union would yield the child. This attempt to run ahead of God turned out to be a bad idea. And as Genesis 16, 4b through 6 shows, when Hagar conceived, it created a rift between the two women. Hagar looked down on Sarah, Genesis the 16th chapter in the fourth verse, and Sarah retaliated with harsh treatment. When Hagar fled, God comforted her and encouraged her to return to Abraham and Sarah with the promise that God would bless her offspring. Now the baby born to Abraham and Hagar was named Ishmael. Eventually, God made it clear to Abraham that Sarah would bear him a son, Genesis the 18th chapter, the 1st to the 15th verse. Isaac, the child of this miraculous conception, would become heir to God's promise to Abraham. Yet, with Ishmael still in the mix as Abraham's firstborn son, the situation was ripe for more conflict. Which brings us to today's passage. Today's scripture is Genesis, the 21st chapter, 8th through the 20th verse. 8th verse. And the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. And we are not told exactly when a baby was expected to be weaned. Much later in Israel, Hannah, another barren woman, who God enabled to conceive and trusted her son Samuel, into the care of Eli to be raised as a priest. After he was weaned, and this is 1 Samuel, the first chapter, the 22nd through 24th verse. Now this likely did not occur before Samuel was three, maybe four years old. Isaac's weaning was an event to be celebrated. He no longer depended on his mother's breast milk, which allowed him to spend more time with his father and the other men. This important rite of passage for any young boy was especially important for a child of promise, born in miraculous circumstances. Verse 9. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had born unto Abraham, mocking. Referring to Ishmael as the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, emphasizes his relationship to his slave mother rather than his father. Now, Ishmael was about 14 years older than his half-brother Isaac. Uh, and this is in Genesis 16th chapter in the 16th verse. Also in the 17th chapter in the 25th verse, making Ishmael about 17 when this event took place. Now we're never told exactly what Ishmael did or said to draw the accusation of mocking. Now the Hebrew word is the same behind the name Isaac, which means laughter. The word can imply simple amusement, but other contrasts reveal darker possibilities. The same word was used when Lot's son-in-law thought he was kidding about the imminent destruction of Sodom. That's found in Genesis, the 14th chapter. The word also describes frivolity of the in Enola truth Israelite with their golden calf. That's Exodus the third, the thirty-second chapter, and the sixth verse. The term further characterized how a husband and wife enjoyed romantic time together. That's Genesis the twenty-sixth chapter, and the eighth verse, which is appropriate within a marriage, but sinful in other contexts. The final possibility of inappropriate touch is most disturbing. Sarah's sensitivity to anything to do with Hagar or Ishmael may lead us to assume that she overreacted to a teasing insult to Isaac rather than molestation or abuse. But whatever was happening, it provoked Sarah to act decisively given her history with Hagar. Now Sarah was the worst person to witness Ishmael's misbehaving. Verse 10. 
Wherefore she said unto Abraham, Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. As God cast the first couple out of Eden, Genesis 3rd chapter and 24th verse, and later drove Cain from the soil we talked about last week, so Sarah called Abraham to expel Hagar and Ishmael from their camp. Now we should hesitate to evaluate this action in a moral sense, given the fact of God's approval. With our knowledge that God worked through Isaac, we may might be tempted to excuse Sarah's request as a reasonable change of address request. We might ask ourselves, do the ends justify the means? It was cruel to cast out the bond woman and her son, a son born because Sarah herself had willed Abraham to impregnate Hagar. Referring to Hagar and Ishmael in the third person, rather than by name, may have been Sarah's way of depersonalizing them and distancing them as legitimate recipients of Abraham's concern subjecting Hagar and Ishmael to starvation, exposure, and violence, then seemed tolerable to Sarah in some sense. Verse 11. And the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son. Abraham rightly loved his son Ishmael. The father was not naive about the dangers that the boy and his mother would face if sent away. Verse 12. And God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bondwoman. In all that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken unto her voice. For in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Now we might conclude quickly that it is God's will for Hagar and Ishmael to move away. But recognizing three ways to speak of God's will is important. Now the first is that of God's purpose of will, referring to God's desire and decision. And there are examples in Genesis, the first chapter, in the first verse, Acts, the second chapter, in the 23rd verse. The second is that of prescriptive will, referring to God's desire and human decision. Examples is found in Hosea, the sixth chapter, the sixth verse, Matthew, the 23rd chapter, in the 37th verse. And the third is that of his permissive will, referring to human desire in God's permission. Examples are Acts, the 14th chapter, the 6th verse, James, the 4th chapter, the 13th verse. Now, the third of these three is in view here. In other words, God was willing to work with in Sarah's desire as he moved his own plan forward. This act in genuine partnership with Abraham and Sarah Sometimes humans take initiative and then God responds to their actions. Say that God allowed it and saw it as a way to carry out his larger promise for his people. Those larger promises revolve around Isaac, not Ishmael. So God told Abraham to accept the will of his wife. Verse 13. And also of the son of the bondwoman will I make a nation because he is thy seed. In working with Sarah's decision, God did not ignore Hagar or become indifferent to Ishmael, although God was always going to fulfill his promises through Sarah's child. He chose to also make Ishmael a nation because he too was Abraham's son. See Genesis, the 21st chapter and the 18th verse. So Abraham left his entire estate to Isaac. This is Genesis chapter 25, verse 5. After Sarah died, Abraham had additional sons with Keturah. This is Genesis 25th chapter, the first to the fourth verse. Now these sons do not appear to receive the same blessing as Ishmael, but Abraham sent them away from Isaac's family with gifts before he died. And this is Genesis 25th chapter and sixth verse, verse 14. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave unto Hagar, putting it on her shoulder and the child, and sent her away 
and she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. In this instance, as in the story of Isaac near sacrifice, Abraham's obedience to the Lord was seen in his immediate action early in the morning. Genesis, the second chapter and the 40th verse. The only record we have of Abraham and Ishmael together after this is when Ishmael returned to help Isaac bury their father. That's Genesis, the 25th chapter and the 9th verse. For the Ishmael spent time with his, with his dying father is unknown. There is no record of Hagar ever returning to see Abraham. Beersheba was a southern Cana west of Gerar, where Abraham had settled. Genesis 20, chapter 20, verse 1. Later, the entire promised land could be measured from Dan in the north of Beersheba. Indeed, the phrase from Dan even to Beersheba became a catchphrase in that regard. Judges, the 20th chapter, the first verse, 1 Samuel, the third chapter, the 20th verse, and 1 Kings, the fourth chapter, the 25th verse, verse 15. And the water was spent in the bottle, and she cast the child under one of the shrubs. And we are not told how long Hagar wandered in the wilderness before running out of provision. Though we would expect that Abraham had sent her and the child away with as much as they could carry. Cast in this verse, the same term used when Joseph was thrown into a well and left for dead, which is Genesis the 37th chapter and the 22nd verse. We can assume that for Hagar to be able to leave her teenage son under one of the shrubs, he had no strength to walk on his own. Verse 16. And she went and sat her, sat her down over against him a good ways off, as it were a bow shot. For she said, let me not see the death of the child. And she sat over against him and lift up her voice and wept. Now here's a play on words. Measures the distance in terms of a bow shot, which is foreshadowing Hagar and Ishmael's own near future. And you can see this in Genesis, the 21st chapter, the 20th verse, which says, And God was with the lad, and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. The last time she ran away pregnant with Ishmael, God met her by a spring of water and promised that Ishmael would grow into manhood. Genesis the 16th chapter, the 7th through the 12th verse. At that time, she called the Lord, Thou God, see me. It must have seemed to her that God was breaking his promise and refusing to see the current plight. Not giving a thought to her own likely death, she wept for her child. Verse 17. And God heard the voice of the lad, and the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad, where he is. Now the angel of God opened the conversation with Hagar, as the angel of the Lord had done previously, with a question, with a question about her status. But this time, the angel did not wait for an answer. Instead, the unanswered question is immediately followed by the command to fear not. Throughout the Bible, this command shows us dozens of times, often when humans encounter God or angelic beings. This is found in Joshua, the 8th chapter, the first verse, Matthew, the 28th chapter, the fifth verse. Hagar would not have the language of God's love deriving out fear but surely her experience confirmed the Apostle John's words found in 1 John 4th chapter 16th through 18th verse, which says, And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, he that dwelleth, and he that dwelleth, love, dwelleth in God. God in him, because God loved both Hagar and Ishmael. The mother had no reason to fear for her child, when God calls his people to fear not, he calls them to love him and trust in his plan for them. We may wonder why the angel told Hagar that God heard the lad, even though Hagar was the one weeping loud in the previous verse. Nowhere in Genesis 21st is Ishmael referred to by name, which is a combination of the Hebrew words that mean God hears. 
Genesis, the 16th chapter and the 11th verse. By emphasizing that he heard the teenager, God showed Hagar that he was looking after her son personally. He proved her son's name to be reassuringly true. Even it seemed that not even the boy's mother had capacity to listen to him any longer. Verse 18. Arise, lift up the lad and hold him in thy hand, for I will make him a great nation. Now God already had promised that Ishmael would become a great nation. Genesis the 17th chapter and the 20th verse. And God planned to keep his promise. The only other person in whom God made such a promise was Abraham. Genesis the 12th chapter, 1 verse through 2nd verse. Ishmael would have 12 12 sons, as would Isaac, son, Jacob. These Ishmaelites show up in Joseph's story. They were nomadic people generally living in northern Arabia. Verse 19. And God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water and she went and filled the bottle with water and gave the lad drink. Why Hagar could not see the well before is not clear. Perhaps her exhaustion and dehydration prevented her from seeing that what was right before her eyes. Now this water was enough to revive Ishmael and keep her hope alive. The God whom she previously declared to be the God who sees me in Genesis, the 16th chapter, 13th verse, had opened her own eyes. Verse 20. And God was with the lad and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. There is nothing that anyone can do that the Lord does not already know. Nothing takes him by surprise. God kept his promise to Hagar. His presence with the lad serves as a reminder that though God looks after his chosen people in a special way, he also cares for people beyond that group. God set apart Abraham's family through Isaac, precisely to bless all nations. It's Genesis, the 12th chapter and the third verse. How great to serve a God who has always loved the whole world and chose to demonstrate through his son, John, third chapter, 16th through 18th verse. The last time God spoke with Hagar, he told her that Ishmael would become a wild man at odds with others. Genesis, the 16th chapter and the 12th verse. A characteristic one might expect from a boy growing to maturity in the wilderness without a father to guide him or community to mold him. Bows were the weapon of choice in Ishmael's time for hunting and waging war. These skills undoubtedly contributed much to his survival and eventually prosperity. Conclusion Hagar had a difficult life, but as Ishmael's name reminds us, God hears. Abraham's God, who loved both Isaac and Ishmael, is the Lord of all creation, and he cares for all people, and he keeps his promises. He hears all cries of injustice, and he responds with the message of hope. That message must be preached, taught, and lived by his people before the watching world, which is desperate for a better story than the divisions that so often defines our lives. When we hear the world might begin to believe that God also hears. Thought to remember, call out to God who hears. If you have enjoyed this lesson, subscribe, ring the bell. And don't forget, if you would like to start this year off with less anxiety, click in my comments, God's Purpose for You. You will get a 40% discount. It is limited for 30 days, I think but you'll get a 40% discount on my course. It will help you to manage your anxiety, hopefully get rid of it all together and find your purpose that God has for you. Remember to get your shots, get your boosters, keep each other safe. Let's love each other in this new year. And I'll see you all next week.